Hey everybody, Mark Agnesi here. Welcome back. Happy Holidays. Merry Christmas. Feliz Navidad. Welcome back. It's another brand new episode of the Mark Agnesi Show. Woo! Yes, we've taken a couple of weeks off. People getting sick, you got Christmas stuff going on. I got two kids, man, get off my ass. It's tough to do this, all right? So we're back. This is the final episode of the Mark Agnesi Show for 2018. We will be back in 2019 with even more episodes, bringing you some of the greatest guitar players that are up and coming right now that you gotta know about. Tonight, uh, very excited about our guest tonight. Sisters Meg and Rebecca Lavelle from the band Larkin Poe are here. Very excited to have them. Uh, very excited about that band. But first, before we get into all of that, let's see. What's in the news? What's in the news? All right, so in the news this week, this past Tuesday, my spirit animal, Keith Richards, turned 75 years old. Shocking, I know. But more importantly, it came out uh, in an interview uh, in Rolling Stone that Keith has stopped drinking. Yeah, Keith freaking Richards has quit the bottle. Actually, turns out he's quit the bottle almost a year ago. Now, it says he still has some drinks from time to time, but he said he just stopped liking the way it made him feel. And he just didn't want to do it anymore. And I applaud Keith for that. Because you know why? We need Keith Richards around. All right? We're losing rock stars left and right. We can't lose Keith. I mean, the Stones have a huge North American headlining tour coming up uh, in 2019. Let's keep Keith around as long as we possibly can. The world needs Keith Richards. And uh, sobriety ain't such a bad thing. That's what's in the news. What's in the news? So I had a chance to sit down with tonight's guest back in October on the eve of the release of their newest album, Venom and Faith. They are currently out doing arena uh, dates all over North America, opening up for Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band. We're so excited about this group uh, here at the Mark Agnesi Show. Check this out when I sat down with sisters Megan and Rebecca Lavelle from the band Larkin Poe. Hey everybody, Mark Agnesi here. I'm sitting on the couch in my living room. But these two ladies that I gotta say, we're very, very excited to have them here. I'm excited, Jen's excited. Yes. My wife Jackie is very, very excited. <laughs> so excited. I have Rebecca and Megan Lavelle from the band Lark and Poe here today. Thank you guys Hi. so much for making the time in your very, very busy schedule. Where do we start? Um, I guess at the beginning. How long have you guys known each other? Since the womb. Okay. Yeah, I guess that was a great question. Great question. How did you guys meet? Exactly. We started playing music really young as well. If we were talking about yeah. earlier, um, our parents were kind enough to put us into lessons. So we like started. Yeah, classical violin. Like Megan, violin. like with you, I'm like, I'm assuming all the cool popular girls in the third grade were playing lap steel guitar. <laughs> so you're like, oh, I want to play lap steel guitar too? <laughs> right, exactly. Is that, that's pretty much how it happened? Pretty much, you know. You guys walk me through it. So, how does it, it started with violin across the board? Everybody yeah. was violin players? Classical violin. So I think you were three and mm -hmm. I was four. Can you imagine a three-year-old playing sister. a violin? And you have an older sister. How much older is your, the, is the oldest? She's three years older than me. Yeah. Okay, so, okay. And you guys were all playing. Yes. Kind of sibling rivalry, you know. In the violin. When one starts, the next month must. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so on and so on. I think we played violin though for like probably three or four years, and then piano was yeah. added as well. So then we took violin. So you're doing and both at the same lessons. time. Wow. When did they realize that they had like started the family band? Like when did like? Because before Lark and Poe, you guys kind of had like. Yes. The family band, like we the did. Lavelle sisters, right? We did. Like, how far did the Lavelle sister thing go? Where, where, where did you guys take, I mean, did you guys make records doing that? Did you guys oh, just play yes. a lot of stuff? I mean, that was the whole... Let's see, we were there, we were um, the the Lovell sisters for six years. Five years, six years? Yeah. So Five we years? started off... Um, very random. I mean, we played little gigs in and around northern Georgia just for operas and festivals and things, yeah. just for fun. But some friends of ours informed us of a Garrison Keillor's Prayer Home Companion Teen Talent Competition, which is a thing that used to happen. I guess whenever he stopped airing the program, it sort of tailed back a little bit. But some friends of ours said that we should enroll and, and try to just get on the radio. Yeah. And um, we made a little demo tape and sent it in. And we ended up getting selected to go on that show, and that would have been in 2005, right? Mm -hmm. So we got onto the show, and we were within 12 to 20. I was 15, and our big sister was, I guess, 19, almost 20 at the time. 
and we ended up winning. Like so, we went on and played, and we did Roly Poly, lo and behold. That was the song that you guys <laughs> we did? did. We did one of the songs. We performed like three or four songs, and um, we were. Did you do it as a violin trio? I think I played mandolin. I think that we had like broken it up you at that point. At that point, you guys said, "I'm going like starting to, to evolve," yeah. you know. Yeah. And so we we ended up winning that, and I think because of the prestige of of that that radio program, people assumed that we were a serious band. And we suddenly had this this like floodgate open of promoters reaching out to our dad's email address, which was the center our website. Like, will you come and play our performing arts center? Going to form a family band and we're going to tour the countryside. And so we it thought happened. it was a it, cool like, like it was a cool hobby. Like our parents. What would did go you guys go out as? Was it literally just it was, the three of you on stage? Or did you guys, did you guys have put a band no, around you? No, we had or? a band. No we drums. But just all just 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 just, just, yeah. just yeah, yeah, bring a bass player. In. And we were playing posh gigs. I mean, we went from doing nothing, like n not having a career of any description, to full time touring. And and going right. So what happened with school and everything? We I mean, were homeschooled got, from the word go, actually. Oh, so you, they, so you guys it, were so always we just homeschooled. Took it, took it on the road. Took yeah. it on the road with us. It Which was an easy transition. Easy. You guys were really kind of set up for the whole thing. Is uh, strangely, strangely. But the thing that we found so interesting is that our dad was so vehement over the years. I mean, and he's the biggest music lover in our family. But that it was not our job. That this was you do not put all your eggs in one basket. You're gonna go to school one day. Like, how did they do that? Both being doctors. I mean, how, like, how did they? How did they pull that off as parents to? to get you guys around the country to go do all I don't stuff. know. I mean, it's like when you actually look back at the logistics of it I'm, going I'm, down, I'm, like, my it's mind surreal. Is it is surreal. I mean, our dad at that point in time, he was like working every third week. And so he would come with us when he could. And our mom would go out with us otherwise. Right. And I think they thought it was like, oh, this is a well-rounding experience for the girls. Like, we'll do this. This is going to make them worldly. And, and yeah. then you know, lo and behold, here we are, you know, a decade later still doing it. And now they're at home and they're just like, oh God, where are the girls today? <laughs> they're on some guy's couch in Los Angeles. Oh my God, what are we doing? Talking about them. Talking about them. <laughs> Holy shit, where did we go wrong? So, uh, that, that ended when? I mean, your oldest sister, what, does she just didn't want to do it anymore. Yeah. Like, I mean, just, she's just I think running she, I mean, course. Five years older than me, she she's would like reach to the point. Other, yeah, she's she's like, this is a weird way to make a living. I'm out. Yeah. Which was the right choice for her. That was 2010. 2010. 2010. Okay. And that's when we That's when you guys rebanded yeah. at Larkin Poe. Yeah. Really rad combination of traditional blues music and rock and roll. Where the hell did that come from? First of and all, when did that happen? You. So... I mean, I would say that we were listening to classic rock all of our lives because while our, it was definitely our mom's mission to kind of inundate us with classical. Meanwhile, we go on family road trips and our dad is spending classic rock records. But yeah. I mean, like Fleetwood Mac and Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, Almond Brothers, Almond Brothers yeah. huge one. Black Sabbath. So like, we got a really interesting musical, musical education. And hearing the blues all along, but not really understanding how to create those sounds because we were we didn't have drums. We didn't understand what an amp exactly did or what a distortion <laughs> pedal might do. Yeah. Like no, I'll tell you it. what, transitioning from mandolin to playing guitar, my biggest hurdle was just dealing with the volume of the instrument because you become so handle, used to it. Yes. And you're like, oh my yeah. God, it's so loud and like everyone can hear me. Like that was a really interesting shift. So I think realistically it would have been in like the first three or four years of Larkin Poe we started pushing more into an electrified sound and understanding how to accomplish those sounds. So really, this is this is the, you guys have kind of even as Lark and Poe have worked, oh, in, have kind of like worked into this. Yes. This mm -hmm. sound, the slide guitar thing. Uh, who are the slide? Growing up like listening to like, like the, the Almond Almond Brothers. Yeah. And then kind of going back and listening to who. Who my the Almond and Brothers have been got listening to, mm -hmm. and a lot of that that slide guitar stuff from Delta Blues is has been really inspirational for but, me. But lately. but most all that music is played on a on a regular guitar. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you're kind of a, equating all like when 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 do you remember when you got your first like electric, uh, yeah. lap steel guitar? Yeah, that must have been in the first year of Lark and Poe, was when I would have gotten my first lap steel. Um, so you were the first person in the house to get an amp. Too. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, she man. was rocking the bus, Got the man. hardware. She She's got extra accessories and shit. Oh man. I got a Fender amp. Yeah. And I got Good start. actually mm -hmm. um, not this 
lap steel, but the same kind of lap steel, the mm. Bakelite. Uh, yeah, Rickenbacker Bakelite mm -hmm. lap steel. And I just happened upon it in Gruen, Gruen's Guitars in yeah. Nashville, and you know picked it up and started tr trying it out on a few songs at first, and then pretty soon I switched over to only only that, that one. That's pretty much. <laughs> You're an electric. Yeah. When did you really sit down and commit to go? Yeah, you know, I'm gonna if I'm gonna be if we're both gonna front this band, I gotta play guitar. Like when did, when when did that happen? That's a good question. I think it was 2013 or 14. We're, realistically, we're talking like Larry Poet already mm -hmm. had already been around and started yes. before you really before you really committed to that as kind of yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was like essentially just playing acoustic on electric. Just, you were just playing. Yeah. And then once I got a distortion pedal and started playing around mm -hmm. with my distortion pedal. Oh, yeah. And trying to write riffs. Oh, yeah. Game then changer. I was like, oh, I actually really want to get better at this so that I can have the facility to write the riffs that I hear in my head, but I just can't get out. I want to talk about social media, like YouTube, stuff like that. You guys do a lot of videos and stuff. We do. How, how has that changed? How has that changed, like, the band in terms of, like, getting people to recognize you? I mean, you guys do a lot of covers. You guys do, do like, fantastic oh, versions of stuff. Kill it. And I know you guys get a lot. <laughs> like, how, how important is that to uh, finding your audience? I you guys attribute a lot of your audience to people finding you guys through those social things? Or do you guys Yeah, just... I would say yeah. yes. They I know, I, I, I know you, years, guys, yeah. you guys are racking up like hundreds of thousands of views on YouTube on stuff pretty quick on, on, on some of these new videos you're doing. Which is it, exciting. And it's always, it's a double-edged sword. I, I get, I, and I get it that because you're sitting there doing a cover of somebody else's song. Like, it's true. And, and to be honest with you, like we started, we call it the tip of the hat series. And we started that as a learning tool because I think that we were sensing that we were getting complacent and it's... Like once you reach a certain point and then you're writing your own songs, I think a lot of people can appreciate, or a lot of musicians can appreciate the plateau that you enter, where it's like, yeah. you're not learning as much. You're not we'll like, stop. Yeah. oh, like I'm not gonna sit down and learn this riff, or I'm gonna learn these lyrics, I'm gonna learn somebody else's tunes. And so we hit that point and I think that we wanted to like continue learning and it was fun. And so we started this video series, and then we had a couple that ticked into getting like Get more of a viral thing going on. And so yeah. then we were like, oh, well, this is fun to play with. And then our, our team, our management team, were like, yes, this is good. Like, we should continue doing this. Like, it's really helping. Yeah. We're seeing like an effect on ticket sales and the buzz that's, that's being like sort of spreading hither, thither, and yon about what Larkin Poe is. And I do think that it's a really great way to introduce yourself to people because it's a big ask when when you present a song to someone that one they don't know who you are they don't know your song they don't know what you stand for you know like there's a lot of unknowns and in a way being able to give them a song that they're familiar with with your own spin on it it's sort of like a it's a handshake it's like oh hello and yeah. actually it seems very counterintuitive but I think yes. working up other people's songs has forced us to find our own voice <laughs> Trying because, to come because, fresh, yeah, fresh take because we have wanted to it to sound like Larkin Poe, and what does Larkin Poe sound like? And this has been a great tool for us to say, okay, here's a lot of different songs in a lot of different genres, but they all hopefully sound like us, and it has made us think more about what what is that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, a huge input on the sound of the band, or I mean, our our first two. Um, Full-length albums as Larkin Poe were produced by other people, yeah. And they went in from directions. from from songs picked by NR people or or all original no, stuff all that original. you guys you guys always have written mm -hmm. the, the the music, but yeah. producers have had a bigger role and in the sonically, sound. Sonically, yes, the sonics but, of the records would be pushed in directions that we couldn't quite like at the time describe why it didn't feel right, but also it just it. They're beautiful. They're cool records, and they're beautiful and everything. But they they didn't really feel like us so much, and so we felt, all right, well, if we're gonna try and sound like us, then we need to figure out what that means. What that sound is. And yeah. so that's when I started digging deeper into the programming side of things and figuring out, like, okay, well, when when I say I want the drums to sound a certain way, what does it mean? And what kind of patterns am I talking about? What textures of drums? And for me, usually it winds up that for us, we don't like a traditional straight up kit sound like 
Megan and I don't really like symbols. Like, a, like I'll do some hi-hat patterns and I like hip-hop hi-hat patterns that are like very musical and help support the lyric and the riff and things like that. But just drums for the sake of drums, which I really feel for the drummer that tours with us because he's having to like bastardize his the, instrument and be like, all right, well, let's approach it like this. Your last record, Peach, uh, was fantastic. Uh, it's just, it just, just a great time from start to finish. Where, where does the new one, does, does it kind of take, pick up right where that one left off? Is there a new sound on the new record? Ven it's called Venom and Fade, right? Venom and Fade. Well, we had such fun making Peach. I feel like it was a really freeing experience making that one, so we knew we kind of wanted to follow in the footsteps, just in the way that we approached the next record. Yeah. yeah. Although we knew we wanted to include more originals because Peach was half covered and half original. There's a lot of like traditional, yeah. like, I mean, traditional, traditional like, yeah. blues. standards, blue yeah. standards yeah. on that record, which are great, and I love a lot of this. So this is all, these are all... There's, um, there's two, two traditional Two ones. traditional mm -hmm. tunes the on and the rest of them all you guys yeah. on the thing. So I think that people will hear more of, of the evolution as songwriters with this. Yeah. And, and more of our own emotional perspective, given that we're the ones writing more of these songs. So I think it, it continues down the path, but definitely within the same, like... Highway markers of peach. It's yeah, if they yeah. like that record, they're gonna. I hope so. Continue on the journey with you guys. Yeah. Here. What do you guys have to say to the the next generation of girls who are thinking about picking it up, or what does it mean to you to to potentially be the reason why? That's awesome. The, the, I mean, I mean, do you guys look at it like this is like? Yes. We can really. Uh, well, we can really. And again, I, I would say to boys and girls alike to understand the importance of a real instrument that we cannot just disappear into our computers. Like I know that there's there's so much focus being placed on electronic instruments. Well, and you're talking about sequence on stuff, yeah. but still on top of that comes a performance yes. on, a, learning, on a live learning instrument. Learning how to take part in a musical conversation is key, regardless of what kind of music you're making. I think it's important to pick up a guitar or whatever instrument, a slide guitar, whatever speaks to you. And if you're wanting to write songs, le learn how to play. It'll only, it'll only better your experience, you know? No. Their new album, Venom and Faith, is out on November 9th. 9th. Dude, you guys, and, and once you get this and you get hooked, go back and buy Peach, go back and buy all the old records. Thank Rebecca you. and Megan Lavelle from Larkin Poe. Thank you guys so much for coming Thanks. by. It's been Wait. an absolute. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you guys. <laughs> I wish you guys all, like. Hey, I, I I hope everybody goes out there and listens to it. It's, if you you guys are missing out you're if best. you're not hearing it, it's so fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you guys so Thank much for coming you, Mark. by. I really appreciate having you. Thank you guys. For the full unedited interview, uh, more bonus footage, extra musical performances, even show and tell with some of their favorite instruments, make sure you subscribe to my channel below. Uh, I promise, there's some bonus footage coming. Make sure you subscribe and get ready for it. And also make sure you check out Lark and Poe. You can find them on Instagram, uh, at Lark and Poe. You can also check them out on their website, larkandpoe.com, for all the newest news, videos, uh, tour dates. There's plenty of them. And make sure you guys uh, go out and see them uh, in 2019. Also, just a, a, on a side note, since sitting down to that interview, uh, their album, Venom and Faith, was released in November and, of course, debuted at number one on the Billboard chart. So big congratulations to Lark and Paul. Make sure you go check them out and give them a follow now. So for this week's dumbass guitar accessory, um, just, just watch. Hi, my name is Dave O, and I'm a musician living in Kannam, South Korea. I use Guitar Q. Guitar Q is extremely useful for any guitarist or bassist who has a smartphone. Guitar Q is a smartphone stand that attaches directly to an acoustic guitar, an electric guitar, or an electric bass. Stop! Stop it! Stop! <laughs> oh. What is the fascination with attaching fucking screens to everything? I just... And by the way, where was he from again? I'm living in Kannam, South Korea. Oh, okay, cool, got it. Uh, even he looks pissed to be doing this, but I know what you're asking yourself. Once I have this screen attached to my guitar, what can I do with it? Perfect. I can read sheet music. I could text, do a video conference with my girlfriend and ask her to marry me.
Stop, stop it again. I can't, stop. I can't, I cannot watch anymore. Oh my God, I can't take it. For starters, is it just me or did that song kind of sound like Wonderwall mashed up with like every Third Eye Blind song that I hated in the late 90s into just one colossal turd that some guy named Chad's gonna be playing at a Christmas party next weekend? Oh my God. And then the text message, uh, I get it, trying to be funny and stuff. Uh, some of you out there are saying, I don't know what the big deal is. Uh, I think that's a pretty good idea. <laughs> some of us, well, we probably wouldn't be friends in real life. But okay, I get it if you're, if, you're, if you're using it as a tool at home during practice to watch a video tutorial or to uh, see a chord chart while you're learning a song or something. I suppose I get it. I will give you that. But after jumping down the uh, internet wormhole of the whole attach my cell phone to my guitar thing, I found out these guys aren't the only ones doing it. Check this out. There is the discreet and convenient suction cup the thing right to the face of the guitar model. There is the, uh, the IPO. The IPO is great too because it's multifunctional. And uh, if you're doing a Wonderwall tutorial, you'll always be in the right key. It's a perfect combination. And then there's this one here too that's more of the snark kind of model that just permanently stays attached to your headstock making you look like a douchebag. <laughs> Where, do we still have the uh, do we still have the thing with the the guy in the fanny pack? Put him up again. Remember this guy from the snark episode? <laughs> Guys, it's the exact same thing. First off, what bothers me about this is this is so much more than a practice tool. And what they're really selling these things on is not the practice tool element of it. It's the live performance element. It's the having your charts and the lyrics right here while you're playing on stage. And that's what I have a serious problem with. If you don't know the words to the song yet, you shouldn't be on stage. If you don't know the chords, you should be at home learning how to play the fucking song before you come on the stage and perform. Maybe call me old school, but I think, you know, if you're up there doing your craft, you should have some craft. I don't know. It's just, I, I don't get it. It's another one of these things that just makes guitar players look like a douchebag. It's the reason why people think guitar is dead and you all have to knock that shit out. If you want to use it as a practice tool in the shame of your own bedroom, that's fine. Go ahead. But I swear to Christ, first person I see with one of these things on stage is going to get publicly humiliated. And then I'm going to go home and I'm going to cyber bully the shit out of them online too. This stuff has to end, guys. There's no need for it. No purpose. Stop putting fucking screens on everything. I'm sick of it. There you have it. Another installment of Dumbass Guitar Accessories. So there it is. The final episode of the Mark Agnesi Show for 2018. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure you subscribe to the channel below. I promise there's going to be some additional content coming. We've got more musical performances. We have show and tell uh, with most of the artists and some of their favorite instruments. We've got some, some funny blooper things. We've got the full unedited interviews. Make sure you subscribe. Also, make sure you give uh, my guest tonight, Larkin Poe, a follow. You can find them uh, on uh, Instagram and at Larkin Poe. Also, check out their website, LarkinPoe.com, for all their tour dates and information. And make sure you go out and get their new record, uh, Venom and Faith, that is available anywhere you get music and to take it home. Here we are again in my living room, Rebecca, Megan, and myself playing a Three Dog Night classic, Never Been to Spain. You guys have a great holiday season. Happy New Year. We'll see you in 2019 for new episodes of the Mark Agnesi Show. Peace. Well, I never been to Spain.
first taste, oh right? Bring it in. That was super fun. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed that. Amazing.